anyway, to get back to Jorge, um, he has, he's also an entrepreneur and he started Contiki Tours mm -hmm. many, many years ago in Peru. And he's now has a few hotels. Yeah. So when he works with you, he gives you so much information. Yeah. Plus, you know, he's very aware of the energies in the different sites, etc. And one of them that's really very, very powerful is called the Doorway of Amaru, which is in Lake Titicaca area. And according to legend, and I've been there twice now, and I actually have had a exceptionally profound experience it's a actual mountain with the doorway cut with the in doorway it. cut in it You've i was going to ask you about it earlier yeah. about yeah. the ritual where they stand and they do the yes. in there yes. Yes. Yeah. i'd love to go there now he is a speciality when it comes to this doorway because he lives in the area and he'll take you all behind and there's hundreds of other places behind there that are so steeped in Inca history, really, um, pools that they used to um, divine in, star stuff that they have connections with. Anyway, my experience at the doorway of Amaru, and I mean, I've heard that some, it's an interdimensional doorway, yes. and I've heard that someone quite close, in fact Dora told me, that someone that she knew actually disappeared through that doorway. They went to visit the site, they were standing there and the next minute they were gone, never to be seen again. So it's kind of like, that's the kind of energy that's there. And when I had my experience, it was during my initiation, my last initiation. And it's quite a short doorway, so you basically kneel. There's like a little plinth and you kneel on the bottom part. Mm. Then you put one arm up in each corner. And there's an indentation where your third eye goes, and there's an indentation where your solar plexus goes. Yeah. And you lean into it. Well, when I did that, it was like I was in a wormhole. I literally spun into this like a galactic wow. wormhole. Like spinning and like <laughs> light, like you can't believe and whisked out the other side where I was blinded. I couldn't see anything for this light. And I believe that who I came into contact with was Lord, the High Priest of Lemuria, wow. Lord Amaru. Wow. Because if you look at Lemuria, the name Lemuria, it's Lemura, mm -hmm. and Amura, Amaru. Is, it? is the name of Lemuria. Wow. And the feeling, that was the most important part, was the actual feeling of utter bliss and love. Hmm. This huge gold light that just poured out this energy. And I just didn't want to leave. So it was actually very hard for me to actually come back and very emotional so when I did get back it was like why do I have to be here because this is actually what it's all about so that's the kind of experiences you can have when you wow. visit places in Peru yes. now to the western world is what they've been doing for those 14,000 years and what's been happening is prior to 2012 they actually had murmurings from the High Elders. Now these High Elders live in the Andes and they have never been in contact with anyone other than maybe one or two of their own people. They basically like these High Lamas that go and sit in the mountains and just meditate and vision the world into being. Mm. They actually hold the energy of literally Mother Earth. And they had been, because the Andean tradition is very, very star-based okay. as far as um, frequency of energy, as opposed to other indigenous 
shamanic cultures would tend to be more earth-based although they have an earth technology as such mm -hmm. they all the the wisdom that comes through is mainly very high frequency mm. star wisdom fortunately for ourselves i have this belief around relationships that your partner is not there to fill the needs within you that you lack and this has only come through hindsight and experience because we obviously are led to believe that you're going to have this wonderful prince who's going to come riding in on his white horse and save you and bring you this amazing life but through understanding and maybe this is my gift in that I have I can put myself into somebody else's shoes and I can actually see life through their eyes and from their perspective to understand why people do things the way they do things and I then came to realize that part of the process of a relationship is that you have your moments where you will grow together and then you will grow apart and the secret is to find the common ground to come back together at a higher level almost like you're going up in a spiral rather than throwing the towel and say I'm done with this I couldn't be bothered because relationships are very difficult if they are worthy um, they are not meant to be easy yeah. so if you can keep that perspective in mind and say this will pass and it's up to both of us to actually find that thread that runs through that we can actually get back on track again and every process that happens to either one of you is going to grow you and this was what my explanation was to my husband was that whatever I'm doing is actually benefiting you I'm not here to make you unhappy and whatever happens with me is only going to be of benefit to you and when he realized that coming back from Peru he was then quite content with the fact that in fact he was my chief advocate he would say well you know are you going to do this can I help can I come and do this for you whereas before it was like okay you get on with it and do what you need to do so there's been a huge growth in his understanding as far as how the relationships work. Mm -hmm. And I think kudos to him for realizing, because I mean, a lot of people would have said, well, I'm not going to deal with this, I'm out of here, you know. <laughs> Especially after 40 years. Yes. So yes, it does, it does. And the thing for me, I think also is that I have the tolerance and the understanding that not every person is going to be on the same page when you want them to be there. And you have to accept that. Mm. We grow at our own pace and in our own way. Mm. He might not do what I do, but he's very connected by means of being athletic and being outdoors and knowing how to garden. I mean, he grows the most amazing food. So he has an affinity with plants that he, and he's very intuitive but he just won't admit it, so who am I to judge him for that? So Carol, for some of the people who might not know who you are, don't you want to give us a brief description of who you are and what you do? And... Okay, so I would say that I have possibly come to this place where I am right now through a lifetime of, obviously we all have our, our life experiences that bring us to a place, but I have to say that I come from, on my mother's side and my father's side, very exceptional woman. My, my father's mother was an incredible herbalist, and in those days it was quite something to actually heal people through natural, intuitively herbs. And on my mother's side, my gran was very psychic, and my mother was very psychic. And from an early age, 
From the age of three, I started dreaming. And I could remember my dreams every morning when I'd wake up. And sometimes I would be so confused, I wouldn't know where I was, in what reality I was. So my connection was through the dream state from a very young age. And I was taken to amazing places, things that people would have said, you're completely nuts. There's no, nothing that exists like that. But when you're so young, who are you? You don't imagine those things. They real. So obviously my connection was through my dream state and that's where I got my wisdom and my guidance. And through my lifetime, because of my um, family experiences, I would retreat to dream because that was where I felt safe. And that also helped me to understand how to look at life through someone else's eyes. And I followed a few traditions. Um, I was at a mystery school for a few years. I followed North American Indian traditions, but never felt that it fitted me absolutely perfectly. And obviously, um, motherhood came in and that had its place. And once my daughter was grown, I could then actually go back and really start really working on, on my, my spiritual aspect. And that's when I found the Andean tradition, or it found me. But prior to that, I had a very strong calling to the African tradition through my ancestry, because on my mother's side, she was very connected to an area in the Eastern Cape where they were the only white people that lived in amongst a community of black people. And I grew up going to this farm area every school holiday. and only having black people around me to actually interact with other than my cousins who couldn't speak English by the way, they all spoke Corsa. So they only learned to speak English when they started school. Wow. So my connection was very strong to actually follow that shamanic path from a young age. And I had a resistance, I don't know why, I can't tell you why I had, I just felt it was very harsh and I wanted that love, I wanted that softness around the heart and that I found in the Andean tradition and that's how I became um, initiated into the tradition because I found that it was that heart energy that I was really longing for and the work that I do now is that I facilitate full moon ceremonies every month and obviously solstice equinoxes. I do blessing ceremonies for marriages, births. Um, I've done a couple of people who have passed over that I've actually done a specific ceremony for them. Obviously house clearing and I teach. I teach the Andean tradition plus I also teach the Munai Ki which is a too much noise, yeah. The Moon Eye Key is actually a consolidation of my 10 years of Inca Andean training. So Alberto Villalda, in his wisdom, he obviously has also done his training through the Andean shaman in Peru many, many years ago. And they've guided him to actually bring through this condensed version of your proper training your shamanic training that you would do over a long period of time because again the elders feel that we're in a place that we can actually hold and anchor the energies efficiently without blowing our fuses whereas when we were sort of earlier on in time we weren't in a place energetically to actually hold that much energy so quickly so now we've evolved enough that you can actually so I spread it out over a four month training period allowing a person to really integrate the energies and I also do healing work and I facilitate tours to Peru as well earlier in our conversation you were speaking about the the different um, methods of shaman up, uh, oh, in with Peru, with, yes. Yeah. 
Um, well, they have they have what they call the T1 T1 T Suyu T1 T Suyu. It's the whole of Peru in the old days was although it was ruled by an Inca or a, a like a king an empire. He had many areas that were under his guidance and interestingly they never had the philosophy of annihilating their competition. Their philosophy was that they would incorporate the competition into the empire. So what they did was, if there was tribes like in northern Peru, which were the Mochica, they became part of the Inca Empire rather than wiped out and ceased to exist. In the southern part you had the Aymara, which is from Bolivia, Tiwanaku area into Lake Titicaca area. So you've got three main um, there's actually Chavan, which is also a small tribe that's in the northern part of Peru as well. So in the northern part of Peru you've got the Chavan and you've got the Mochica. Then you've got down south the desert you've got a little bit of Nazca. You've got the Nazca tribe. Then Titicaca area and Colca Canyon you've got the Aymara. But the highlands from from inland from Lima and Cusco down a sort of little bit south, they call that the highland area, is the Kira. And the Kira are the, are the direct descendants from the Incas. And they are the ones that carry that exact same wisdom. And that's the tradition that's been passed on to me. And this is the star tradition of, yes. of working with yes. the blessings and yes. the heart. Yes. And then you have the ones that work with the ayahuasca. The, the Mochica and the Chavin are, they are, um, they're still very honoring of the earth, etc. But they like to do their ceremonies incorporating the plant teachers and the plant teacher for the Mochica is the San Pedro. In the Amazon now the upper Amazon is still part of Peru so that is um, guided by the Shipibo. The Shipibo Indians in the upper Amazon are the masters of ayahuasca and that's the plant teacher that they work with. And then you've got the Andy, the, the, the Kiro, who only use coca. Now coca, they don't make a medicine from it, they'll chew it. But the chewing of coca is actually to give them energy, because again they have to work at high altitude. And without the coca, they would not perform the tasks that they would normally do. So it's the, the medicinal properties of coca just by chewing the leaf it relieves altitude sickness and it gives you energy you can live on coca leaves for approximately three weeks mm. without food so if you stuck in every kira has a coca tree at their front door and they'll pick the leaves as they need it and always for ceremony I mean when you go to a ceremony they will have their manta which is the cloth on the ground filled with coca that they'll open and they'll pick out the most perfect leaves to use in their ceremonies mm. um, and again when you get to Peru if you get to any hotel you'll find a big bowl of coca leaves and you are told you have to make a tea and you take the leaves and you put them in your cup and you pour hot water on it you let it steep for a while and you drink it and what I do to prevent altitude sickness is I take the coca leaves and I put them in my water bottle. So I'm drinking the coca the whole oh, day. Amazing. Yeah. And the good news about coca is if you have a weight problem, it takes away your appetite. You oh. actually don't want to eat, so you lose weight.
<laughs> I lose about five kilos every time I go to Peru <laughs> because of all the hooping and popping up and down the mountains <laughs> plus the coca tea. There's no ways I can't lose, not lose weight. <laughs> because when I look at sites in Peru, I often think, now the Kiro are about this tall. They're under five foot. They're that tiny. Wow. And the first time I saw them, I thought they were in the wrong country because they look exactly like the Tibetans. Mm -hmm. And this is why I say it's the connection with that um, the same spirituality because the Andean tradition is exactly like Buddhism it's just more practical and down to earth because it's the same philosophy they've got the same high cheekbones they've got that little bit of skin in the corner of the eye hairless men no hair on the face beautiful straight hair the only difference is that they are more brown in color because they have a lot more sunshine than they do in Tibet. But again, built to walk in those mountains, the same as the Tibetans. Mm. Short legs and when I look at this, the steps I think well how on earth do you get up them? because when they talk about climbing steps they're that deep. And you literally up and up and, up and right up a mountain. And their pathways never go like the donkey, like we do, like this. They go straight up. <laughs> so you literally like two steps, stop, breathe. Two steps, stop, breathe. But yes, it, it's definitely quite an eye-opener to see that they definitely have traveled and they have, I believe, crossed the Bering Strait come down through North America and now settled. And the beautiful thing is, Drunvalo Melchizedek wrote a book called The Serpent of Light. And this is exactly what this is about. The, at the, the masculine aspect of the Earth's energies were situated in the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. And that was all around the mind, mm -hmm. the mental aspect of Buddhism. So that energy, when they talk about the shifting of the poles, that energy has now moved from the Himalayas and moved across through South America and has now settled in the Andes, which is the feminine divine, the heart energy. And that is why everyone is so drawn to go to Peru because it's the connection with the feminine aspect whereas the northern hemisphere and if you look on the map they are almost like a mirror image north and south northern hemisphere southern hemisphere i mean the himalayas are the highest mountains in the north and andes is the highest in the southern and they're both growing they're both getting higher and higher mm. so it's all around the serpent of light the kundalini that's moved and is now situated in the andes mountains of peru bringing alive and bringing back the divine feminine and the woman shaman there are very powerful they have no there's no separation of the sexes like a woman's job is to do this and a man's job is to do that. There they interchange. In fact, they revere their woman because the woman is actually more powerful than a man because she gives birth to babies. She creates life. So she's like Mother Earth. She's actually, and you'll see a woman in the fields and you'll see a man in the kitchen. So it's actually quite refreshing. And this is at a very, um, sort of not they don't have to be educated it's not it's it's something that they've done throughout the, their time they they've had this understanding that there's no separation and they revere as equal their, their female counterpart so it's not like women can only do this and men can only do that like some traditions they will say well if you're a woman you can't follow that path because it's not part of what we believe in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, their healers are 
they're very powerful healers are the midwives and the herbalists um, and the ones that are women so yeah they're very much aware of mm. the feminine aspect so thank you that's very interesting so now i was thinking about um this whole essential retreat yes. conference that we're doing yes and the whole being in your senses and being in your body is there some advice or some insight you can give to youngsters or people on a spiritual journey about, about that well according to again going back to my training in the andean tradition you have to be in your body to function because you have to be centered firmly on the earth. Um, we know, if we weren't meant to be in physical form and grounded on the earth, we couldn't possibly interact at an intuitive level with the elements because we'd be wafting out there and we just wouldn't actually have any access to it. So for them, and the fact that they have this practical way of working with energy it doesn't take you out your body it actually brings you into your body mm. so you can you can meditate yes and you can have access to that higher realm but you can still do it in a practical way as well by being in the physicality nitty-gritty mm. of everyday life and in order for you to function in a balanced way it's important that you do stay in your body because if you're going out of your body all the time you're actually out of touch with reality mm. well let's take that part of the conversation a bit deeper and actually speak about what happens when you um, have energy leaking or you have you open yourself up to okay let's let's go into that all conversation. right so for them the biggest thing is to actually you are the master of your own energy there's no one else that can help you to have a strong energetic field you are the master of your energy and it's up to you to follow practices that is going to strengthen your energy field and they talk about the pokpo which is your solar plexus and they talk about your energy bubble and having that clear and psychic sludge and all the negative aspects and how you can work on a daily basis to actually keep your energy field clear okay so what are some of those toxic sludges and well they can energy? be they can be thought forms they can be intentions of someone they can be um, you could be in an area where there's a lot of heavy energy for example that hasn't been cleared let's go back to particular places that create and carry negative energy or heavy energy mm -hmm. um, that hasn't been cleared away like good housekeeping you walk through there it's almost like toffee that you are tracking in and you're actually holding on to and the, the thing is if your frequency is not kept at a certain vibrational level you are more susceptible for that energy to actually attach itself to you so you are in a position to actually keep your energy as high as you possibly can through meditation through what I call good spiritual hygiene and keeping your space clear mm. if you're a healer cleaning your healing space often they have a tradition where the woman will take herbs and one of them is rue or ruda which we have in our own country and it's a little yellow flower on a bush that grows and they'll pick a whole bunch of it and every morning every shop that's in every city or town will have its doorway swept with rue and Ruda gets hung among, above the door so that every person who walks in and out is actually cleared energetically before they go into the shop which will bring abundance and goodwill etc. 
So again, it's going back to old traditions that held value and were very sound in their understanding about energy. So I would say that that is, again, we are evolving, but we've lost the wisdom along the way. And what used to work doesn't work anymore. So we have to revisit. We can modernize it and upgrade it, but still remember that it worked. It was, it and was. This is part of the cosmology that's unfolding now through the elders. And the fact that humanity has reached a place where we can actually hold the energies that they're bringing through. That's why they've allowed those that have been called to come to the shamanic path to actually receive the training hmm. because they, it was a closed circle prior to that. And only for the for uh, their their community. Yeah, yeah. They, they sort of by, by lineage. It was so what is the message that's coming through now? What is the message that they would like us as Westerners to understand? The message about? is huge. Um, joy, huge abundance. They say we are stepping into the golden age. They say the next 2,000 years is where humanity is going to be in a place that they could never possibly imagine to be as far as um, good news. And their philosophy around the way we treat the earth and that the earth is going to deteriorate and you know it's, we're going to kill mother earth they laugh at us they actually say if mother earth wanted to flick us off like a fly off her back we would be gone in an instant yeah. and she would still be here so it's almost part of a negative programming yes. to get people not yes. to realize that yes. we actually have a point have of power where we are the, the main thing their main philosophy is love heart-centered energy. Everything comes from a place of munai, love. Yeah. And from that love, respect. Because we've lost respect for the earth, we've lost respect for ourselves. So they have this belief and this they live by, is that if you have respect and love for everything around you and yourself, then everything will flow. There'll be no, nature never struggles. Mm. Their philosophy is if a river comes down in flood, it's never going to struggle to get where it needs to go. It will automatically bend and move in whatever direction it needs to go. Because that's the nature of the elements. And if we can be more in tune with the elements around us, and we are made up of all of those elements. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a very high propensity to actually relate 100% to water, to earth, to air, and to fire. Mm -hmm. So if we can balance those within ourselves, then obviously we have the recipe for a very harmonious life. Mm -hmm. And then by being in harmony with ourselves, everything else will become harmonized around us. And it's only because people are so out of balance that that's the problem. Yes. And their, their philosophy is for us to become aware of coming into that perfect balance of masculine and feminine, opening to the intuitive abilities and having the biggest thing having respect because through that respect comes the wisdom so it's it's a very simple it's simplistic and this is what I loved about the tradition there was no bells and whistles and there was no big hoo-ha it was basic simple stuff that you could you there's no ways you would not understand what they were trying mm. to say and the beauty of it is because it's so simple it's easy to do you don't have to have a degree to get through the whole thing or you don't have to study for years and years and years it's so simplistic yeah. so this morning you you did the dispatcho blessing yes. for us don't you want to just talk a little bit about that well the dispatcho blessings are very very common in peru 
this is their way of particularly showing their gratitude and their love for their common man. For example, if, if someone is, they have the belief that there is always reciprocity and there's no condition stipulated on that reciprocity. We in the West have a condition attached to our, if I give to you, mm. you owe me so much. We have a condition. They have no conditions. So for example, if someone's going to have a child and they want to have a ceremony for blessing that child, that becomes common to do despachos. Despachos are done for everything. Anything that they could possibly celebrate, they will do a ceremony. And if a couple marries, for example, in their little communities, the whole community comes together to build them a house. Lovely. So that that couple actually knows that at some point in their life, there's no stipulation mm -hmm. and there's no stipulation on how they will repair it. They will obviously reciprocate in whatever way is appropriate for them. So some farmer might need his lands toiled and planted and they'll step in and do it. And if there's an abundance of one particular type of food in one area and not so much in another, they share. So it's very much like our so-called Ubuntu, um, but there it works. And that's the part that when you come the away from that, yes, yes. It, yeah. when you come away from that environment and you, you, you look at it in a slightly detached way, you actually think, why can't the rest of the world get this right? Because it is so easy and it flows and it's so, the people are happy. It's not like they feel deprived. They're not wealthy. They don't have lots. Mm -hmm. They have very simple lifestyles. But they are so rich when it comes to their spiritual fulfillment. And that's the difference. They place that above all else and everything else falls into place. Wonderful. They know that they will be provided for. They've never doubted that the earth will not supply for their needs. And that's how they live their lives. And that's why they are... You'll hear music wherever you go. Because if they're out in the fields and they're working or they're just walking in the mountains, they're always playing their flutes and their music to actually appease the spirits, to actually please the mountain spirits, the water spirits, and literally Mother Earth that they're walking on. And they know that by doing that, it's not kind of like, well, I have to do this. It's because I want to do it. It's just an honoring. And these dispatcher ceremonies are very much around all that having humility and having the understanding that if you give in love and honor to the earth, you will receive back. At some in some way, and they do that in all their sacred sites as well, which is another thing that we could take a huge page out of their book, because you, I have had the experience where I've been in Egypt, and those sacred sites there are diminishing in energy. They're very depleted. The reason being that the culture that lives there is not the original people. So they do not have the same respect mm -hmm. and understanding mm -hmm. of what those places represent. Mm -hmm. So when you go as a tourist or even if you're going as a light worker, everyone will process whether they are aware of it or not in a sacred site because that is the nature of sacred mm -hmm. sites. They will shift you to move into your into your right perspective and you will deal with things along the way and you will release energy into the space. So what they do in Peru is that the shamans are constantly coming into these sites to do ceremony, to clear the energy. Yeah. So they're clearing that energy of everyone else that's walking through and releasing their stuff they will clear it on a regular basis, so they keep the frequency high. Whereas in Egypt, the only ones that are doing the work 
are those from outside that come in and everyone is taking, taking, taking and no one's putting back into that energetic vortex to actually keep the frequency high. So that gives you the, the actual comparison between the cultures of understanding around sacred sites and we in this country need to do the same. We need to actually also honor the fact that we have got some very powerful places but we don't do enough ceremony in them and that's possibly one of the you know, things that because it's a bridge and me being in South Africa as well as traveling to Peru sort of being the in-between is to bring some of that back to South Africa what I would like, my, my greatest passion and my greatest love is to actually see people coming into their own personal power in whatever way that may turn out, whether it be through connection with the natural environment, through an understanding around their energy fields and their energy work. Um, or coming into wholeness through ceremony. So for me, I feel that part of my work is to actually assist and encourage people rather than let them feel that there's no hope for them because this is part of the reconnecting back to our roots and bringing back those tried and trusted ancient traditions that the Western world, other than I would say the Jewish tradition, has eradicated from their lives. Rites of passage, honoring a person through a time that for them is exceptionally important regardless of what they've accomplished, just acknowledging them as a human being. And markers through their lifetime that we disregard now and that's what creates that feeling of non-accomplishment of who am I what am I here for I don't have any worth so for me it's to bring back that sense of confidence in your worth and your contribution to society so that for me is what I feel is the most important aspect in humans connections with one another because it's very easy for someone to drift off and feel that they don't have and mentoring mentoring has fallen by the wayside and I have been amazed at how many young people have come to me and said we need to have someone who can explain to us what's going on because they are advanced, they have what they need, but they're still adrift. They don't have the guidelines to help them to say, well, this is okay, you're not, you're not losing it. You're just going through a process. So yes, that's, that's the part I feel that maybe that's why I'm in what I'm doing and the time that I'm doing it now as well. So you've got, uh, you do one-on-one. -on -one. And you I do, do group. group. And I would also do workshops. Um, so, yeah. And I'd what about uh, webinars or Skype? Or I haven't gone that route yet because I'm not really into the digital world as such. I, I don't have enough knowledge around it. That's my biggest problem. So people can find you here, they can yes. contact you yes. and yeah. um, your email will be yeah. on the yes. video and yes. they can contact you directly. Yeah. Directly, yeah. And then I, base, I do, I have to be honest, I do prefer human to human contact much more than I would over Skype. I just feel, I know energetically it's still the same, but I feel that it's too easy for us to use, to lose that human capacity so true. yeah so true so i prefer to work 
because then it's spontaneous then you find you reading energy all the time you're getting the feel of what's going on with the person and it's real um, someone on a, on a Skype you turn off the, the screen it's you're not sure whether it's actually whether it's real or it's easy to talk on a phone and say something by not being there it's very different when it's face to face to somebody then it's real mm -hmm. you can you can actually feel the difference well I do anyway mm. so do you, are you called an Inca priestess or I'm an Inca, Inca priest or? Inca priestess which is part of uh, you know there's a lot of controversy around being called a shaman um, we don't term it as shamans we term it more shamanic practitioners because we are dealing with the spiritual aspect of the field of magic rather than the actual shamanic magic so I would say we are priestesses or priests rather than shamans but we do definitely have access to the unseen world. <laughs> well, there you have it. Thank you so much for uh, spending time and yes. updating us all and letting us know what you